no can to see is an RPG Only when that I need is the RPG for me I no can to see is all that I play All other games are lame It puts them all to shame I only play games that are popular Hey, welcome to Half Glass Gaming. I'm Julian Watkins. As always, I will be uh, in control of this session. I have a gavel. Um, I, I don't want to strike it, but I will. So don't you dare make me hold you in contempt. I'm looking at all of you right now. I'm he doesn't at... actually have a gavel. A metaphorical gavel. It is metaphorical. Joining in the conversation, uh, I have Rev. I, I, that is what I'm doing. I have uh, to my right... Actually looking almost like a uh, JRPG version of uh, Mary Tyler Moore. I have, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's my aesthetic. <laughs> I have Mandy. Hi. And of course, looking gruff and tough and Afro puffed, it's uh, Josh. Just Josh. Yeah. He he. Josh is the one who looks gruff. I'm the one who spent 12 minutes last night with a guy six foot two, 320 pounds, just drilling each other with clotheslines. And he also uh, has on a cool shirt that says Space Space Odyssey. Music club and brew pub. That's actually not what it says. It says space oddity, <laughs> but, uh, oddity. Thanks for, but thanks for playing. <laughs> no, it's um, Beth Kinderman and the player character is a local folk rock band. I uh, run a party room at Convergence and MarsCon here in the Twin Cities, and I got this shirt from donating money to help keep it run because they always have a lot of good beer. Speaking of beer, uh, I didn't buy beer for this session, and so the Rev showed up with a gigantic bag full of Twinkies. Yeah. None of them are Twinkies, goddammit. They are Swiss rolls and zebra cakes. Mandy, where do you stand on that? I mean, most of that stuff isn't vegetarian because it has gelatin in it. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, I don't partake. Yeah, I don't eat any of it. I prefer carrot sticks. Me too. Yeah, 50% of this podcast is vegetarian. Yeah. And the other half eats enough meat to make up for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I think Josh is still a little boozed out from the last time we went to Renfest. Well, that was like a month ago. Yeah, that's And still. you're just now sobering up. <laughs> that means you did Renfest right. I think he's just not comfortable to talk about these things. <laughs> no, we went back and I got Josh like a tankard and then a tankard strap to yeah. carry it. And he was just constantly drinking weed the whole time we were there. Nice. You got tanked on a tankard. No, but there is like supposed to be a beard contest going on while we were there and like nobody had beards. So I don't know if like they were hiding out somewhere grooming their beards mm-hmm. or but like Josh probably had the most impressive beard at Renfest. And while his beard is sexy, it's not that impressive. Yeah, uh, everybody was hiding away with their beards apparently. We I don't know what was going on. I think your beard is akin to Geralt's actually. No. <laughs> 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 it's it's a, a Joel from The Last of Us. Yeah, 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 yeah Joel from The Last of Us. I'll give him that's, Geralt. No, I see a little Geralt in there, man. I gotta tell you. You know how long does it take Geralt's beard to get down to the middle of his chest? It doesn't because it doesn't grow naturally. I had a, I shaved my beard the first time I came across a place that allowed me to do it. A groomer, I right. guess. I don't know. And you've just kept I, clean shaven since then. No, no, it grew back. Probably within a couple of hours of actual hours of gameplay. But uh, since then, I mean, it's pretty much just kept a length that's comfortable. I do like games with beard growing mechanics, though, like Deadly Premonition. Deadly Premonition. Or don't Starve, where beard growth is actually super useful. Mm-hmm. Like, you build strategies around your beard growth. That's kind of well, amazing. I like Deadly Premonition because if you didn't bathe, you'd get the flies kind of yeah. buzzing around you. I think they have that in Metal Gear as well. Yeah, and, and if you don't bathe for long enough in Metal Gear, First, you'll start seeing flies surround you, and then when you get back to Mother Base, Ocelot will throw a bucket of water mm-hmm. on you. I think, actually, also enemy soldiers can detect you by uh, <laughs> stench if I, it's rank I, would, I, I, cool I have a uh, Skyrim mod that also adds bathing mechanics, and it does that very thing. The, the longer you go without bathing, the more negative your sneak skill goes mm. i haven't managed to catch the uh vulture and the african vulture or whatever yet and so it was like 
planning on not bathing for a while and then just like laying out in the <laughs> African savanna and mm-hmm. see if vultures start showing up. Can you just like kill an animal and uh, leave it there? And oh, That's a good question. I don't know. I, I feel like not bathing is the more interesting strategy. It's Did certainly have... the more hilarious one. Yeah. <laughs> Do they have beard growth mechanics in Middle Gear Solid 5? No. No. What a bummer. I think the hair looks pretty lousy in MGS5. I mean, even in The Witcher, like Geralt's hair, if you have the, the default hairstyle, it looks amazing. And mm-hmm. everyone else's hair looks like... Sims. Yeah, it looks like <laughs> Sims hair. Like Steve Harvey or something. <laughs> like Yennefer's hair just totally looks like a Sims hair mod to me. Like yeah. one of the really fancy ones and then you download it and it just looks like the fakest thing. I, I was playing The Witcher a bit last night and Yennefer was wearing a big hood, mm-hmm. but she, like her hair was still like curled and down. It was it looks so weird. Serious hair looks pretty good. Yeah, serious hair looks but right. maybe they, <laughs> hair. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. <laughs> they use the same hair for Siri and Geralt. Well, it's the same hair color. It's completely different styles. Siri usually wears it up, but Geralt's is like half up and kind of long and flowy. And that's the hairstyle that looks really good in the game matching scars but i mean even hair. if you get even if you get like a different hairstyle with Geralt, it doesn't look as good it's like uh, they yeah. put a lot of time into that one hairstyle and, mm-hmm. and only that one it's yeah. a good hairstyle Geralt's pretty hot with silence i mean he is yeah he's he's nah. cut <laughs> he's an attractive video game character he's uh, eh. swole as they would say it's too much i like i like a big burly man as much as the next person but i just i don't know it just feels kind of forced he's not really that you big no he's not he's not he's really super skinny and probably like 510 he, he like yeah. some muscle but like more toned than yeah. very the little body fat i guess he just doesn't do it for me you know who's hot is dojima from persona 4 See, I haven't played Persona 4. I was before. playing Persona 4 Golden last night, and I'm like, hey, Josh, look at this hot guy. And then he's like, that kind of looks like me. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you, who do you think is the hottest character on Teen Wolf? <laughs> I have a is friend. That, is that the 1980s Michael J. No, Cox it's movie? an MTV <laughs> TV show. I have a friend who bugged me, like, Mandy, watch Teen Wolf. Mandy, watch Teen Wolf. So I watch it. I watch, like, five seasons of this TV show. And he's like, oh, now we can talk about Teen Wolf. Who do you think the hottest guy on Teen Wolf is? <laughs> <laughs> and I was, you could have sent me a wallpaper. Right? Like, that would have saved me like, a lot I could, of time. I could have seen a picture and not have watched five seasons of a television show. <laughs> but he made it sound like he wanted to have, like, a discussion about the storytelling elements. But all he wanted to talk about is, like, do you think Peter is hotter or Derek is hotter? <laughs> and look, like, we Styles all know is Derek pretty is hot too. <laughs> No. I would rather talk about the Michael J. Fox movie personally. <laughs> but Dojima has some scruff and you know, you don't see a lot of facial hair in JRPGs. That's true. No, I, everybody looks like they're prepubescent. Well, Japan has like a really weird view of facial hair. There's actually a lot of facial hair discrimination there. Like most, really? com- yeah, most companies have bans on facial hair and they'll fire people for growing facial hair. It's uh, partly because it's associated with the Yakuza. All the Yakuza bosses yep. have mustaches. Okay. And it's partially because it's associated with foreigners and Japan is a pretty xenophobic country. But uh, also there is actually a countrywide ban in Japan in the 17th century. Any kind of facial hair huh. is because uh, samurais grew big beards. That was what showed their fighting spirit. If you couldn't grow a beard, like you wore a beard wig, that's what samurais did because it was just disgraceful. Mm-hmm, right. And so when Japan became a civilian country, getting rid of the sign of the fighting spirit was a part of that. So the only way you could legally have facial hair in Japan for decades was if you had scars on your face, you could grow facial hair to cover your scars. Because they figured scars did more to corrupt the moral character of Japan than beards did. Yeah. See, but then the funny thing is, it still didn't help anything because if they had a beard, you'd know they had scars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, these, these lawmakers didn't really think things through. But uh, it, it, so, so there's still a carryover to that today. I mean, you see some, even in JRPGs. Mm-hmm. This one time uh, on a forum, this guy shows up with a Mario avatar and he's like, can you name a single JRPG? RPG protagonist that has facial hair, I dare you in the first post is the cover of Super Mario RPG. (laughs) (laughs) And that is... That is technically a JRPG. Oh, there, yeah. there are a lot of Mario JRPGs, and they're pretty good. I actually think my favorite is Bowser's Inside Story, though. All right. I think this will be a good time to call break uh, before Mandy completely erupts. 
into uh, JRPG uh, greatness. <laughs> Plus, I need to get another zebra cake. He needs another zebra cake. Uh, Josh needs to twiddle his stash a bit, and uh, I'm just going to zone out for a little bit. I have a stash. He has a beard. He's got a stash. Can, no, he's got a beard. He has a beard, but the, the beard's on the, the bottom. Mustache, the stash is on the top. When the mustache connects to the beard, it's just a beard. It's you still know, a mustache. All facial hair in Japan is called hijay. I did not and know that. And then they, they, they add words add to it to... to designate where it is so yours would be kazuro hj <laughs> okay <laughs> i and you know i need to dashes start... would be uh ago hj <laughs> i need i need to start using that in the ring since i do this you know geeky gamer gimmick i'll just you know start referring to to what what was it <laughs> kazuro hj kazira hj <laughs> okay i listen <laughs> This I really, is the best tangent. <laughs> this this break is going to be so brief, okay? <laughs> but we got to take one. So I'd like to thank uh, 2XAA, Wheelie, Retrovolve.com, HalfGlassGaming.com, GeekParty.com, iTunes. I'm slapping my hand. If you hear that, we'll be right back with JRPGs. Welcome back from the break. A lot has happened. None of it I can talk about. But what we can start talking about is JRPGs. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Mandy. Me? Yeah. She acts surprised, folks. But I, look. I think you are the uh, unmitigated expert on all things Japan in this podcast. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a weeaboo. No, and that's a term that I don't even know. So you're going to have to explain <laughs> I, that. I do. I know the origins of the term weeaboo, but I don't know why it's used to describe Japan files. But mm. uh, are you familiar with a comic strip called Perry Bible Fellowship? I am. There's this comic where it's a bunch of businessmen and it's like, it's weeaboo time. And then they start yelling, weeaboo, weeaboo. And then they start like spanking each other with paddles <laughs> so that's the origin of the term weeaboo i don't actually know the origin of Weird. the term jrpg but mm -hmm. i know that i had kind of hoped that that wasn't the origin of that term no that's the first usage of the term weeaboo is that very bible fellowship comic i feel like my worldview has been destroyed in some way but i can't tangibly explain why hmm. Actually, before this episode, I spent a lot of time trying to find who the first person to use the term JRPG was, and I couldn't find it. I looked into uh, the search history, mm -hmm. and nobody was searching for it until July of 2006. So apparently it started being used right around there, hmm. but I don't know where it came from. I actually really have a problem with the term JRPG. And why is that? Well, for one, it's just inaccurate in that there are lots of games that are referred to as JRPGs that don't come out of Japan. I I mean, Korea produces RPGs. China even produces RPGs. Mm -hmm. uh, Western countries produce games that are clearly modeled after JRPGs. Mm -hmm. And there's just no other genre ever where people refer to it by its country of origin. I see people saying, well, Japan is the country where this style of RPG originated, but people use JRPGs and WRPGs for Western RPGs. If that's where it comes from, then it makes more sense to use, like, US RPGs and JRPGs. Mm -hmm. And I seem to recall um, back during the Super Nintendo era, they were just referred to as console RPGs yeah. to differentiate them from tabletop RPGs. And console RPGs, like, felt more correct to me just because it was more inclusive but now they're all on like pc as well and so then you've got that well i figure when you're using a pc for gaming purposes that's that's your gaming console <laughs> the first japanese rpg was also on pc it was a koei game called dragon and the princess that came out in 1982 plus there was all mm. that <laughs> there's there's the connection between uh you know, Koei developing the first JRPG and also developing the first porn game. Over time, the uh, the kind of like an urban legend started surrounding it where, where people said that a lot of JRPG developers were originally developing porn games. And that's that's not, in the case of Koei, that's true, but in, in most other cases, it's not. There are a lot of Japanese developers, though, that started out making visual novels. Uh, Yuji Horii, who made Dragon Quest, 
called Dragon Warrior in Japan, which is really the true first JRPG, I would say, and that that's the game that really influenced all other JRPGs. He made Portopia Serial Murder Case, which is actually considered to be like the most influential visual novel. That's also the game that got Kojima into game development. He really? said he played that and he's like, oh, this is what I want to do for a living. So if it wasn't for visual novels, we might not have Metal Gear. That's mm-hmm. true. No, look, if it wasn't for Konami, we might not have Metal Gear. Okay, let's give them credit. If it wasn't for Konami, we (laughs) might have Metal Gear. (laughs) If it wasn't for Konami, we might have Silent Hills. (laughs) No, but uh, Hironobu Sakaguchi, who created Final Fantasy, also started out with visual novels. Uh, he made interactive fiction games before he made Final Fantasy. Mm-hmm. So I actually can see how that did influence the JRPGs and that they're very, very story heavy and very story driven. Mm-hmm. And I think that's so many influential JRPG creators coming from that background. Plus, mm-hmm. I'm thinking like now about Dragon Warrior and... Um, like Final Fantasy and that era of uh, console RPGs where it's only a step or two up from a visual novel. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, like I can I can absolutely see the visual novel threads in there. It's a visual novel with RPG mechanics on yeah, top right. of it, which is really exactly what I would say a JRPG is. Aside from like origin of development, what would you say separates, quote unquote, I'm air quoting, JRPGs uh, from WRPG. I'll or... preface this by saying I know the Rev disagrees with me on this, but I think that the difference is really the way they used role play- tabletop role-playing games mm-hmm. to develop the games. Uh, in Japan, they looked at the mechanics. The emphasis wasn't on playing a role. It was just on the core mechanics, like the level-up experience points are modeled after tabletop games, whereas Western RPGs, they looked at the playing a role mm-hmm. part and made that the emphasis of the game. Uh, the two most popular games in Japan the year uh, the first JRPG was created were Wizardry, which is a given, but also Load Runner, which is mm. a puzzle game with like uh, a level editor, mm-hmm. maybe the first game to feature a level editor. And so you can really see the roots of that in general in JRPGs because puzzles are also a huge part of JRPGs. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, puzzle solving stuff in Wild Arms. See, and to me, I almost feel it's the exact opposite where, you know, the Western RPGs, like I can see it being translated as playing a role, but I often feel like the Western RPGs don't really give you enough freedom of like genuine choice for it to be a role. You know, like let's look at Skyrim, for example. You know, oh, well, you have all these options and you can do all this stuff. Yeah, but nothing you do really changes the narrative in any way. You know, so like you can kind of play a role, but it doesn't really matter. Where it does differentiate from a JRPG is it doesn't try to tell a linear story the way most JRPGs do, which knowing now that like so many of them started with visual novels, that makes a lot of sense how that came about. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like you look at your Final Fantasies, you look at your uh, Dragon Warriors, you look at your Breath of Fires, uh, they all focus on the storytelling aspect, whereas the Western RPGs, again, you could define it as playing a role, but I define it more as building your stats. And so it gives you much more control over what you are building. And so I feel like Western RPGs do focus more on the mechanics than the JRPGs do. Whereas, like, there's some mechanics of choice and menu and what you equip and whatnot. But by and large, the actual stats, which is what I think of when I think of mechanics of tabletop RPGs, Mm -hmm. like, those are all invisible. Like, you know, you level up and it just, here's your stat upgrade. Mm -hmm. So that's, to me, that's the difference. Mm -hmm. I, I would argue that more modern Western RPGs. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back to The Witcher Three on this one. Yeah, hey, we um, always have space. I was looking at all of the different endings you can get in the game, mm-hmm. trying to untangle the threads of how you unlock all of these endings, and there's like so many like little tiny choices that affect the narrative in such like drastic ways it's this completely tangled mess of plot lines and it's really hard to to figure out like okay if i kill this guy that's going to be good for me down the road or that's going to hurt me down the road or whatever it's it's like a really hard like those choices aren't obvious mm-hmm. until you until you uh either play through them all or you find a guide that helps you 
out. Uh, I think Skyrim is a lot less linear than the Rev gives it credit for. Because I like to me. Well, I see. I'm not saying it's linear. I'm saying that you're you as the player, your choices are not narratively important. Which, like, you can make your own story, but ultimately, you know, like, I have just already defeated Alduin. Now I'm going to go do the Civil War. Oh, you're still referring to me as if I'm this untested pup that you've never heard of, even though I just saved the fucking world from the World Eater. That's great. So, like, nothing you do in the narrative matters, even though you're doing stuff at your own leisure and how you choose to do it. Have you ever played Trails in the Sky? Uh, I have not. The NPC dialogue changes constantly. So like anytime you do even a small thing, like everybody's dialogue will change. It's so hard for me to progress in the game because I just always want to go talk to everybody over and over again. I've seen uh, the script for the game and it's like bigger than the last Harry Potter novel, like twice the size. When you, after you open a treasure chest, you can even go back and talk to the treasure chest. (laughs) And the treasure chest like insults you. It's like, haven't you taken enough blood for me? (laughs) (laughs) That's great. But I think like The Witcher, um, Skyrim I would put in a separate category, but I, I think you could look at a game like Mass Effect. I hate Mass Effect. It's not like the best, but I mean, there are choices that you make throughout each game that kind of comes back in surprising ways. And I feel like that sort of thing in Western RPGs is more recent. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I'm remembering, you know, being told like Diablo was a a classic Western RPG like Baldur's Gate. Mm -hmm. And these, by and large, didn't have a lot of choices what they had was a focus on building your stats mm-hmm. and finding new treasures to build your stats more. I mean, Mass Effect actually feels like a very Western take on visual novels. And mm. having played a lot of choice-heavy games before that, I was really frustrated. One of the things that drives me crazy in Mass Effect is that all the time you get, like, dialogue choices, and then all of them are basically the same thing. Mm. So you're not really choosing anything. Like, you're making little phrasing choices. I mostly hate Mass Effect because the combat is too terrible it's so bad right it is bad yeah i tried to go back to play the first that's one, like actually, i feel yeah. like everybody has at least one classic game that mm-hmm. you, they just hate and mm-hmm. for me that's mass effect yeah i had a grudge against western RPGs in general for a while because i just really didn't like mass effect and because people were really into all these bioware games that i just didn't like that much mm-hmm. i mean i like plenty of western rpgs i like bethesda stuff in general yeah it's really just i don't like bioware as much as everybody else does and Mm -hmm. i think it's because i played a lot of visual novels i played a lot of adventure games so a lot of the things that people were treating about it as revolutionary didn't feel fresh or new to me you know let's look at chrono trigger a a classic well-loved really popular jrpg where you had all these multiple endings depending on where you decided to beat the game that was you know vaguely new at that time, but only vaguely. There was other stuff that happened. And, you know, JRPGs started with visual novels, which are known for having branching story paths, etc., etc. So is it that Mass Effect was really good? Or was it that Mass Effect brought this aspect that the Western gaming hadn't seen as often? Mass Effect certainly wasn't the first, but I think it really popularized a new way to look at choice Mm -hmm. and to be like, oh, you can affect things through the dialogue you pick, or you can decide the fate of a character, and then, you know, a game or two later in the franchise, like, that choice still comes back to uh, have repercussions on the story Mm -hmm. and things like that. And that, I think, is pretty mind-blowing to people who didn't grow up playing visual novels. Mm -hmm. Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, which... I know it was not this, you know, it was on the- barn burner hit <laughs> or anything. Uh, but, you know, I li- I really like the game. I- I've got 95 hours logged on it. It had a lot of branching paths depending on dialogue choices. It had NPCs you could kill or, you know, dialogue through stuff. You know, it gave you multiple ways to get through the same thing. You know, I remember uh, getting through a crack house to get something or another and i could just go in and beat the shit out of people i could try to stealth in or i could you know try to talk my way in depending on what my stats were 
and that game was like from what 2004 maybe somewhere in that area so you know before mass effect well i think for me mass effect was the first game that i had played um it had decisions not so much even in the dialogue which i always found frustrating you know they'd give you the examples of what you want the character to say which are basically just like summations of what he would say right but weren't actually sometimes i would pick a a phrase that i thought was what i would want him to say and, and he says something completely fucking different but i think it was you know deciding whether or not this alien race should carry on and then what effect that might have two games down the road or there's that annoying uh, army guy that you kind of see rise through the ranks who's like your biggest fan or the uh, news uh, broadcast uh, woman that kind of continuously shows up you could punch her in the face at one point i think and I, I thought that was kind of clever i never really experienced that before i mean i think the thing that mass effect did that really made it stand out was that choices you were making would carry over into future games in the series and that was the thing that was getting attention even to have a small choice carry over from one game to the next game felt kind of innovative and i realize a lot of people love mass Effect. It's just it is a series i have a big grudge against for a lot of reasons what what would be considered the first Western RPG? Because oh. <laughs> most of my experience has just been with like recent games from probably two console cycles ago. I'm not entirely sure, but I know there were text-based RPGs even back in the 70s. Having played a number of the text-based RPGs, you know, like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and Zork and stuff... Those are almost their own genre. You could almost say they're in a genre that you could call like, I don't know, text-based. Right? <laughs> you could almost call them text-based well, RPGs. I'd, I'd say they're closer to interactive fiction games. Sure. This is the problem with uh, video game genres is, is some of these genres started in the 70s and 80s and technology has advanced so much and gameplay has advanced so much that they have almost don't even resemble what they started out as. And, you know, we talked about in our episode on platformers, we talked about Donkey Kong being a platformer and being very different from Super Mario and then even more different from Super Mario 64. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the same thing with the Western RPG starting with text-based gameplay. And Mm -hmm. then, you know, as technology advanced, they could do more stuff with it. And, you know, today we've got The Witcher 3 and Mm -hmm. Skyrim. and Yeah, but with Donkey Kong to Mario 64... You can see the progression. Have you played Zork? I actually played Zork on Call of Duty Black Ops. And on the menu screen of Black Ops, your character's like strapped to a chair and you can like wiggle free and then go walk and and play a computer. <laughs> and you can play Zork. And that's where I actually played Zork. Nice. Okay, but if it was Zork, then you've played Zork. I like there's not much of a similarity other than there's a story to it. There's not the kind of progression that there is with with the platformers you just mentioned. Well, I mean, I think Zork came out of the mindset of, like, how can we make D&D into a video game? I think people operate, you know, when creating something like The Witcher 3 or Skyrim under that same, like, how can we turn D&D into a video game? However, they're influenced by three decades of, of role-playing video games that they can draw from as well, instead of instead of having to draw from the ground up. Fair enough. I think there are some similarities just in what the developers were trying to accomplish, and they might not be immediately obvious if you just play one. You know, if you play Zork and then jump to Skyrim, like you would probably see very little similarity. But I think the developers were trying to ac- at least accomplish similar things mm-hmm. with the technology that they had mm-hmm. to work with. Well, and I think um, Witcher, Skyrim, these games sort of evolving with the technology available. I'm not a big JRPG guy. So for me, it's kind of like I don't really know much about where where it's at now. I think of JRPGs and I think of like, quote unquote, like classic, you know, 16-bit or whatever. Now, with the new sort of console technology it seems uh jrpgs have kind of had a a larger 
presence on handhelds. But no, and I think that's true. And I think it largely happens because Japan is a commuter culture where a large portion of people will spend hours on trains mm-hmm. in the day. And mm-hmm. so people will just sit down and play a handheld video game. And that's going to be the bulk of their gaming time. Mm-hmm. And so there's just a bigger drive to develop games for those than consoles, which are not unpopular, but certainly decreasing in usage in Japan. Mm-hmm. So would you say that JRPGs are tied to a certain art style that kind of um, has more of a place on a, a handheld console, which maybe no, I, I doesn't require say that's massive. True. I mean, like, if you look at a game like Nier or Mm -hmm. Lost Odyssey, they actually have, I would say, an art style that would be more associated with Western games, but they definitely both feel like Japanese RPGs or uh, the Nabunaga's ambition games, which have, like, the art style influenced by Edo Japan. And uh, there aren't that many, like, Mm -hmm. 16-bit style uh, RPGs anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, it sort of seems to be a decline of JRPGs in general, at least, I think, in the Western hemisphere. I think our consciousness of them is is decreasing Mm -hmm. but they're very strong and i think they're doing a lot of interesting things that even you know game reviewers and things in the west aren't even like noticing or talking about very much i think a lot of people judge the health of jrpgs by final fantasy final fantasy is their litmus test for how jrpgs are doing which is really too bad because i feel like um the final fantasy series since yeah, let's say 10, which I liked Final Fantasy 10, but I'm going to say 10 uh, has been a desperate attempt to see how far up its own ass it could crawl. I liked 12. I don't think 12 was a good Final Fantasy. I think it was a good game. Hmm. I, fair. Like I said, I liked 10. I still feel it was trying to crawl up its own ass. No. Mm-hmm. The, actually, lightning, the lightning stuff completely jumped the shark. It was... it, it, like... Nobody liked lightning. Then they're like, "Here's more lightning." Well, what? In the, I think I think in Japan, Final Fantasy Thirteen was very popular, and lightning was a very popular character. Mm-hmm. And so, okay. in a Japanese development <coughs> studio, seeing like, "Oh, hey, this is super popular here. Let's keep making it." Like, doesn't make sense to us here in the mm-hmm. West because we're like, okay. we fucking hated this shit, and right. they keep making it, but. Like, over there, it was very well-received and very... I I did not know that, but I do know that oftentimes Japan is like, what is America like? Oh, right, we don't give a fuck. But, I mean, they they should be like that. Yeah, like, doesn't that help them sort of continue to make what they make best without worrying about what we think? And if we like it, then we can sample it. I actually feel like part of what went wrong with Final Fantasy Thirteen is that it was a really misguided attempt to appeal to a Western audience. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, like, the open world stuff, it just happens so late in the game, but it's there. Like, you mean it occurs late in the game? Yeah. Okay. Well, the thing with Final Fantasy XIII is the game is basically a hallway for maybe, like, 12 hours. That is a long hallway. That's like a Tom and Jerry hallway. Which I feel sort of started with Final Fantasy X. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But then you get to this big open world, and, like, if you'd started out in a hallway and been there for, like, an hour and then been in the big open world, Mm -hmm. it would have felt just dramatically different. So, like, I remember playing Final Fantasy VII and feeling like the entire time in Midgard, I was like, is it going to open up anytime soon? Because Final Fantasy VI, which I still maintain is probably in the top five best JRPGs of all time, you know, you had the opening bit in Narshi, and then once Locke saves Terra and you get out of there, you're on the map. Mm -hmm. Like, the world is yours, and really there's only, like, very limited places you can go, but it still feels much more open. And then in Final Fantasy VII, it's like, what, the first five, six hours is in Midgard, which feels very closed and, you know, point by point. I hated eight, so I don't remember much details about it, Mm -hmm. Uh, but, like, nine felt much more open. Eight, it's pretty open early on. I remember I did a boss fight in eight before you could, triggered it in the story. When you go to get Ifrit, you can just run off and go in that cave before you get to that part in the story. And okay. so I just went, beat Ifrit, and nothing happened because oh, I wasn't right. to that point in the story. But it was fun. It had the whole, like, all that stuff in the prison in the beginning that just felt like it went on forever. Like I said, I didn't like eight, which is almost too bad because I do feel like they were trying a lot of interesting and innovative stuff that just didn't work. Uh, But then, you know, 9 was much more open, and then you go to 10, and 10 is like, wow, this is a hallway. 
There's a uh, building in uh, downtown Los Angeles that has the longest hallway in North America. Yeah, what building? I, I can't get that information, but it was in a, uh, <laughs> it was in a Paul Thomas Anderson shot music video for oh, uh, I love uh, Michael Penn's song. But that's I do think that people in general and even reviewers use Final Fantasy as a litmus test for how the JRPG is doing. And so if Final Fantasy is doing badly, then people say, oh, JRPGs are doing badly and they don't look at all the other games out there. Mm -hmm. There are some really fantastic games that came out on the PS3. Like uh, Tales of Graces F was great. In a lot of small ways, it reminded me of Lunar, the Silver Star story, which is yeah. like my favorite JRPG of all time. Um, you know that you have you start out as kids and you're you're kind of just playing and you make you know you know you make a new friend and and you're like sneaking into the house and doing all this like fun goofy kid stuff and then you grow up and these friendships are affecting the world and affecting politics and things like that and it's really cool to see that stuff. Another game I thought was fantastic was Nino Kuni. Mm -hmm. It's like everything that I would ever want in a JRPG. You know, there's like monster collecting mechanics and the art is fantastic. The music is like, holy shit. And I feel like there's so much stuff that I don't even know about that's like really, really good. Mm -hmm. But I, I think there's so much great stuff that people are kind of ignoring over here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been playing this game called Lost Dimensions, and it's a dungeon crawler where you have to get to the top of a dungeon and fight the boss. So really basic stuff. But there's a mechanic where there are traitors in your party, and on every floor you have to eliminate one of the traitors, but mm -hmm. it's randomized. So the person who the traitor is changes every time, and you have to like do stuff to investigate and figure out who the traitor is so you don't execute an innocent person. Mm -hmm. And my, my little brother was telling me that it sounds just like the board game Avalon, which I, I think is funny that JRPGs are being influenced by tabletop games in new ways. I think of the board game Clue a little bit. <laughs> I love Clue. I love Clue. I do. Yeah. I, I read, you may not know this, but there were Clue books. I read like 20 of them. Oh, wow. <laughs> Clue is one of my favorite movies of oh, all time. Oh yeah, that's a great movie. I, it is a fun movie. But uh, there's this weird contradiction where reviewers and people who are hypercritical of JRPGs will be like, oh, JRPGs need to evolve. They haven't changed since blah, blah, blah. And then people like Rev, for example, who are, were super into JRPGs are put off by the fact that JRPGs have evolved and innovated too much where basic turn-based menu combat, you mm -hmm. don't see a lot of that anymore. Like RPGs are constantly experimenting with combat and getting mm -hmm. away from the core things. So there's this outcry from people who are criticizing JRPGs for not changing. And then there are people who are drifting away from modern RPGs because they've changed too much. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of sad, but also really interesting. Well, also uh, part of it is, you know, I've mentioned before, I have really bad ADHD. And now that I'm an adult, with the internet and so many different things that grab my attention and not, you know, a younger child where what I have for entertainment is books and my Super Nintendo. It's just harder for me to devote the amount of time necessary to play through a story. Mm -hmm. But I, like there is some innovation in JRPGs that I really enjoy. Um, I would call Child of Light a JRPG because it uses the uh, active time battle system but it kind of innovates on that as an example which was developed by a western which studio. was developed by ubisoft montreal yeah a bunch uh, of canucks i i've got Andy. several of them <laughs> i've got several of them on twitter they're fantastic people and this goes back to you know trying to define these genres by country of origin like you know child of light might feel more like a Japanese RPG, but it's a Western developed game. Whereas something like Dark Souls feels very Western. Or Dragon's Dogma. Right, right. or Dragon's Dogma. Mm -hmm. Like feels very Western, but it's developed in Japan. Mm -hmm. And in fact, with Child of Light, uh, like, yeah, it might feel very JRPG ish, but other than being active time battle, like the story, the art style, everything about it is Western. It's a European style fairy tale story. 
I think that Japanese companies too are realizing that there are people who miss the really classic style of RPGs. Uh, Square Enix at uh, E3 2015 announced a brand new studio called Tokyo RPG Factory mm-hmm. yes. that's uh, dedicated to producing classic uh, JRPGs. At the 2015 Tokyo Game Show, they actually showed uh, footage of one of the games, uh, Project Setsuna. Mm-hmm. And it's a sp- not 16-bit, but it's a sprite-based RPG but for consoles Mm -hmm. with like and a big world and the battle system looks very influenced by Chrono Trigger in one of the trailers you can actually see characters using dual text Mm -hmm. nice I always loved the dual text yeah me too those were so great and uh you know look how look how well Bravely Default did yeah, Which and, is, it feels like an old school Final Fantasy. Mm-hmm. And Bravely Default actually has some of those, the time strategy mechanics. The thing is you can default and not use your turn, but then save that turn and pass it on. So you can like save four turns and then do this massive attack all at, all at once. Mm-hmm. Well, now there seems to be like a, a big... Uh... Hot topic right now is kind of remasters and remakes. They're working on the Final Fantasy VII remake that everybody's been clamoring for, but I don't think anybody's really going to love as much as they think they think they might. Oh, I will. But, I, uh, I can't even I, play I, Final I Fantasy like, VII anymore. I feel like people will love it, but I agree that people are not going to love it as much as they think they will mm-hmm. because they've been clamoring for it for so long. Mm-hmm. They've built up this idol in their head of what it's going to be like, and it's never going to be that. Mm-hmm. As time goes by, I, you remember the things you like about a game and you start forgetting about its flaws and mm-hmm. that's why you know that's why it's so hard to criticize something like Ocarina of Time it's one of the most influential games of all time but it's also incredibly flawed but it also has this beloved place in a lot of people's hearts and so it's really hard to so many years later go Mm -hmm. back and say oh this was wrong with that game people are like no 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 it's Mm -hmm. not but i think final fantasy 7 was another example where people remember the feelings of interacting with these characters Mm -hmm. and like these characters were great the story was was so so great like they are going to forget about a lot of the flaws of, mm-hmm. of the game they're, they're going to forget about how the story was actually really obtuse for most of it mm-hmm. okay is he a clone is he a, a science experiment what the hell was going on here oh i have to play crisis core before any of this shit makes crisis sense. core is a great game. crisis yeah. core is a great game it's, but it, it's also the the fill-in of the plot holes for Final Fantasy VII, of which there are many. It's the ground zero. So <laughs> <laughs> you asked about remakes, and I'm, I'm going into this. I really fucking love uh, Wild Arms. It was the first game I got for my PlayStation. Wonderful game. Loved it to death. Then I got Wild Arms Ultra Code, uh, Ultra Code F, you know, when they made the remake of it. And I genuinely believe that Ultra Code F is like the quintessential JRPG. You're Not, one of the very few people that. I apparently, that a, apparently nobody likes it but me, but fuck all of them. They're wrong. Mm. I mean, the original, the original Wild Arms is fucking great. A lot of the translation is not very well done. There's a lot of story points that are kind of left hanging that aren't explained very well. Uh, there's a lot of mechanics that make no sense. They There's a lot of... Like, there's three secondary characters that are important to the plot that always feel like they're supposed to be party members that are never party members. Ultra Code F fixes all of that. I like the three player... Like, only having three playable characters in Wild Arms. No, so, yeah, I mean, if you like that, you like that. And you still only have three party members but you know i like the fact that now calamity jane is a playable character i like the fact that now i can get zed and now this makes sense and not only that with that it instituted some dual text that can happen with the characters uh it gave you some more interesting stuff to do uh in combat it smooths out the story it smooths out the translation it added a whole bunch of hidden stuff and puzzle uh puzzle box rooms that that added some nice stuff i really really adore the remake and i apparently am the only one and i don't even know how that fucking happens has some has some facial hair in it too a little bit of scruff it has but a it's little, there it, right going forward in the the jrpg genre i was gonna ask you know what are some of the things that you think are done well and you would like to see more of where would you like to see the uh 
the genre headed and are remasters opportunities to take older games that perhaps just were limited by technology that could further uh, elaborate on stories that they were telling but with a, a grander scale is that something that you would be interested in seeing mother let's say well the interesting <laughs> thing about mother 3 is that it was originally supposed to be a 3d game and it only became a sprite based game late in development but they did really innovative things with sprites but uh, I, I just want to see more games with really interesting gameplay mechanics. I, As a kid, I played JRPGs more for the story. And as an adult, I would say, even though there are JRPGs with stories I love, that I play mm-hmm. these games more because I really like the mechanics. And so I just want to see more innovative interesting mechanics more experimentation like how can we use a food system how can we use costumes to affect battle like i think those things are so interesting Mm -hmm. and it's such a cool approach to gaming i I like trying out new games that do stuff like that or like persona 5 which uses heavy stealth mechanics i think that's going to be really interesting mandy paid for some expensive dlc for tales of graces f and she doesn't regret her decision one bit. No, I spent... You can get costumes for free in the game, but you can also buy DLC costumes, and they're really overpriced. They're like 3 or $4 a costume. Mm. I bought high school uniform costumes for every party character until I could have bought like two games for the price of what I paid for all these costumes. Wow. When the battle starts up, they change the theme music, so it's a cheesy high school theme version, and I had no idea, so I just start of the battle all of a sudden i hear this cheesy like anime high school show theme music play <laughs> it's the same theme it's just a remix and oh my gosh like i would have paid 60 dollars for that alone and it, it would have been worth every penny it was magical how wow. much did you pay for it uh probably like 30 <laughs> <laughs> i bought well there are a lot of party members and i bought it for every single party member it, it was like three dollars a cost three or four dollars oh, a costume i wish listeners could see julian's face right now <laughs> <laughs> I think Tales of Graces F has the best combat in any game I've ever played. Though. Yeah. It's like a lot like fighting game combat, but in an action RPG. Mm. And then there are all these different skill building things you can use. And you can use their food mechanics. So you can set it up to cook meals and use the food in these certain situations. Like, So you can set things up so you have the ingredients that like, when a character falls in battle, you'll automatically cook the food so that they'll heal themselves. Oh man, it's so much fun. But I really like playing fighting games. And mm-hmm. so it's like a cross between action RPG and fighting games with clicking mechanics. It's just the best. Wow. It's always hard for me to figure out to the answer to the question, you know, what would I like? Because it's so fucking random for me. Uh, but I noticed throughout time, other than Final Fantasy VI and Seven, the games that I really like JRPG-wise are the ones that keep a really tight narrative focus, like Chrono Trigger. So how long do you think Chrono Trigger is? Probably if you just play it straight through and don't do a lot of side quests and don't resurrect Chrono, you can beat it in probably about 35 hours. It's 15 hours. Okay. Uh, Which it's like, exactly, it feels really long because it gives you so much character depth and it has so much, like, everything matters. There's nothing in it that feels like it's wasted time, which is what you get in a lot of, like, the, you know, big long games. You know, Final Fantasy VII has 40 hours of gameplay. Yeah, and 25 of it is grinding on the world map. Chrono Trigger is this really tight narrative game and everything feels important. Mother 3, it's not a really long game. Everything is very tightly narrative it's very focused. spaced out too because it has chapters and like the the focus of the chapter will be different so like you can clear a chapter in like an hour for right. the shorter chapters right same with uh, Earthbound Mother 2 like so you know Child of Light I love it to death it's about 20 hours long it's a very tight narrative so I think that's what I want out of my JRPGs I'm, like when they sit down and they go okay let's make this game I want them to have plotted out here's the story we want to tell here are the characters we want to tell them with so here's what we're going to have to do with that i just wanted to add that uh hironobu sakaguchi has said he doesn't think chrono trigger should be considered a jrpg okay i just think that's interesting and what would he what would he consider consider it a lousy game (laughs) 
just I an... will power bomb you through a table, <laughs> motherfucker. Just an RPG is that he doesn't think the game follows like the core JRPG tropes, like for example, the Final Fantasy games, which he also made. And uh, Sakaguchi has done a lot of experimentation. Uh, Lost Odyssey, which was on the 360, is probably the best JRPG most people have never ever played. It uses like novels and like dream sequences and like just really interesting stuff. It's like a story about immortals and it feels very influenced by ancient Japanese literature. Hmm. But uh, Sakaguchi experiments more than people give him credit for, even though he's the creator of Final Fantasy. One of the things that, interestingly enough, that I want to see in in JRPGs is a return to the 16-bit RPG, because with development of these things being so easy now, and the discs that contain games being so big now, like... You could just make this like 300 hour long JRPG in like 16 bit with a lot of really cool plot twists and a lot of really deep character work and things like that. And I want to see that. And I don't think anyone's ever going to make that, but I I have a secret fantasy that someday somebody will. Mm, a secret fantasy. <laughs> right, but, but not a, a secret final fantasy. fantasy. <laughs> a secret fantasy that is now public. <laughs> I, uh, I don't think I would ever want to play that, but I want that to exist. Because I, I, I agree. I think it would be really interesting to see, you know, get a couple of some of the best RPG writer minds together and go, okay, you've got 300 hours. I want my I want my brother's Karamazov of RPGs. Right. <laughs> like it's mother <you>, three. <laughs> it totally is. Like you've got 300 hours and only 50 of it can be grinding. Figure it out. Yeah. For me, I just want to see other people happy. Uh, and with that, I think um, we've come to the uh, end of our journey on uh, JRPGs. I think we just wrote the book on it. And uh, look, anything you want to know about a JRPG. Mandy wrote the book on it. We just added the I footnotes. I mean, I should. <laughs> Could make some money. Look, anything that you want to know about JRPGs, you'll find in this episode. And anything that isn't in this episode, that shit doesn't matter. Okay. I think we had a great time. Um, JRPGs, RPGs, QPPs. I mean, you know, <laughs> look, if the game's fun and it's got what you're looking for, that that's really all that matters. What would be nice, though, is if they had created a JRPG that was uh, solely about Gwent, because um, then I would have an entry point, and uh, I could have contributed more to this conversation. But look, that's not what you're looking for. I understand. And I just want to thank you for joining us. Uh, I hope you had a blast. Uh, whether or not it was from the past, that's your discretion. I'm not going to call you on on that one. Um, I want to say thanks again for joining us. Thanks to my man, Jimmy Mamadas, and uh, have a good night. <laughs>